You can imagine how I felt several months ago when a relatively young, healthy-looking man approached me and said, I've just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Would you please speak at my funeral? I had known Flynn as a member of my Defenders class and as a former board member with our ministry, Reasonable Faith. And so despite the feelings of inadequacy that I felt at so weighty a responsibility and privilege, I was glad to agree to do so. Flynn did not want me to deliver a eulogy. Sean and Joshua and Larry have done that far more adequately than I could hope to do. Rather, he wanted me to explain how his faith, his Jewish faith, gave him the courage and confidence to face his impending death. In one of the most famous passages of the Hebrew scriptures, which Ron read to us moments ago, the psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Notice that there are two conditions that underlie the psalmist's confidence and hope. God and immortality. He trusts in Yahweh, the Lord, and he believes that he will dwell in the Lord's house forever. Without God and immortality, every individual human being, as well as the entire human race, is ultimately doomed to extinction in the heat death of the universe. It literally doesn't matter what you do because everything will end up the same regardless. The ancient Jewish writer who called himself Koheleth, the teacher, understood this all too well. In his treatise on the meaning of life, known in English as Ecclesiastes, he writes, the words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the teacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. And man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. In this remarkably modern treatise, which reads more like a piece of existentialist literature than a book from the Bible, the author shows the futility of wealth, power, education, fame, and political influence in a life doomed to end in death. His verdict, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. But ancient Judaism was not without hope. A belief in life beyond the grave gradually developed within Judaism. It was not, however, belief in the immortality of the soul, such as was current in Greek culture. Rather, the Jewish belief in immortality took the very peculiar form of the resurrection of the body. God would someday restore the dead body and soul together. We find a very graphic portrayal of this belief in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, where the prophet sees a vision of the skeletal remains of the dead raised up, clothed with muscle and flesh and given new life. This hope is also expressed in the greatest of the Jewish prophets, Isaiah, who assures Israel Thy dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. O dwellers in the dust, awake and sing for joy. And in the prophecy of Daniel, we read, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Now it's important to understand that Jewish belief in the resurrection of the dead was not merely a belief in the revivification of the dead, that is to say a return to the mortal life. In the Hebrew scriptures, we read stories of persons who have died and were revivified. For example, the son of a certain widow whom Elijah brought back to life. Similarly, during the ministry of Yeshua or Jesus of Nazareth, people were allegedly raised from the dead. Now these revivifications were merely a return to earthly existence. These people would someday die again. Rather, resurrection in the proper sense of the word was to glory and immortality. On the day of the Lord, at the end of human history, God would raise all the righteous dead to live with him forever in glory. In time, belief in the resurrection of the dead became a widespread Jewish hope. And it's interesting to note that Jesus actually sided with the Pharisees against the Sadducees regarding this Jewish hope in glorified bodily immortality. The question then arises whether this traditional Jewish hope is real or just pie in the sky wishful thinking. Well, what happened to Yeshua gives us reason to think that there is indeed something more. As we all know, Yeshua was in a number of ways at cross purposes with the temple authorities in Jerusalem, who by this time were mere appointees of the secular Roman occupiers. In his parable of the vineyard, Jesus made unmistakably clear both his opposition to the temple authorities as well as his own personal radical self-understanding. In this parable, the vineyard represents Israel. The owner of the vineyard is Yahweh, God. The tenants of the vineyard are the Jewish religious authorities and the owner's servants are the prophets sent by God to Israel. Listen to this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant and they wounded him in the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. Finally, the owner said, I have one left to send, my only beloved son. They will listen to my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir, come, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Now, what does this parable tell us about Yeshua's self-understanding? It tells us that he thought of himself as God's special son, distinct from all the prophets, God's final messenger, and even the heir to Israel. In this parable, he in effect predicts the rejection of his messianic claims by the temple authorities and his execution by them. During the Passover feast in AD 30, Jesus was in fact arrested by the temple authorities, tried, condemned, and delivered to the Romans to be crucified for sedition, for claiming to be king of the Jews. The first century Jewish historian, Flavius Josephus, in his Antiquities of the Jews, records, 
Around this time lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was a worker of amazing deeds and was a teacher of people who gladly accept the truth. He won over both many Jews and many Greeks. Pilate, when he heard him accused by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross. But those who had first loved him did not cease doing so. To this day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not disappeared. Now what Josephus here records is extraordinary. Despite Jesus' crucifixion and death, the movement which followed him did not disband, but continued to give allegiance to him. It needs to be appreciated just how unusual this was. When Messiah came, he was expected to throw off Israel's enemies. And in this case, that meant Rome and reestablish the throne of David in Jerusalem, where he would command the respect of Jew and Gentile alike. A Messiah who failed to deliver and to reign, who instead of conquering Israel's enemies, would be ignominiously executed by them as a common criminal was a contradiction in terms. Jewish messianic expectations included no idea of such a defeated and humiliated Messiah. Messianic movements were commonplace in Judaism, both before and after the time of Jesus, and the Roman authorities dealt with them all with the same cruel efficiency. As the British historical scholar N.T. Wright has put it, if you're a first century Jew and your favorite Messiah got himself crucified, then you basically had two choices. Either you went home or you got yourself a new Messiah. But in no case, right across the century before Jesus and the century after him, do we find any other case of a messianic movement saying that their defeated and executed leader was the Messiah after all. So what made the crucial difference for the movement that followed Yeshua of Nazareth? Fortunately, the answer is clear. The followers of Yeshua believed that God had raised him from the dead, thereby showing him to be the Messiah after all. In an indisputably authentic letter dating from around A.D. 55, the ex-Pharisee Saul of Tarsus, now renamed Paul, a converted follower of Messiah Jesus, wrote these words to a church which he had founded in the Greek city of Corinth. I quote, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Here, Paul not only uses the te technical rabbinical terms received and delivered for the transmission of oral tradition, but the four-line formula which follows is filled with traces of Aramaic, the original language of Jesus and the disciples, indicating an old prior tradition which Paul is handing on. Most scholars date this tradition no later than Paul's visit to Jerusalem in AD 36. This means that belief in Jesus' resurrection and post-mortem appearances goes back to within the first five years after Jesus' death. This was the belief of the earliest disciples who had lived with Jesus and who had witnessed his crucifixion. It was belief in his resurrection from the dead that allowed Jesus to be seen as Messiah after all. But this conclusion only raises more questions. For why in the world would the disciples have come to believe such an un-Jewish, not to say preposterous, thing? 
as we've seen Jewish belief in resurrection of the dead, differed in two fundamental respects from Jesus' purported resurrection. First, Jewish belief was always the belief in a corporate resurrection, never the resurrection of an isolated individual. It was all of Israel or all the righteous dead that God would someday raise up. Second, the resurrection in Jewish thinking was always at the end of history, after the end of the world. It was only once God had rolled up the scroll of human history and uh, raised the dead on the judgment day that he would then judge them. The idea of the resurrection of an isolated individual apart from the general resurrection and within human history is simply unattested anywhere in ancient Judaism. The historian who wants to give some account of the early Jesus movement must therefore give an adequate explanation for what N.T. Wright calls these mutations of traditional Jewish belief concerning the resurrection. Confronted with the crucifixion and death of Jesus, the disciples, given their typical Jewish frame of mind, would simply have preserved their master's tomb as a shrine where his bones might reside until that day when they and all the righteous dead of Israel would be reunited in the kingdom of God. Even if they had found Jesus' tomb empty and subsequently experienced visions of Jesus, such experiences would not have led to their belief in his resurrection from the dead. At most, they would have proclaimed his assumption into heaven. In the Hebrew scriptures, we find various figures like Enoch and Elijah who were said to have been bodily assumed into heaven. And the pseudepigraphical writing, the Testament of Job, shows that even the bodies of the deceased might be assumed into heaven. This category would have suited perfectly the disciples' experience. The fact that they proclaimed not the assumption of Jesus into heaven in accordance with Jewish beliefs about the afterlife, but rather his resurrection from the dead, contrary to Jewish beliefs, requires some explanation beyond mere Jewish influences. The problem is there just isn't anything apart from the historical event of Jesus' resurrection that would plausibly explain why the earliest disciples would have come to suddenly and sincerely believe something so un-Jewish and outlandish as that God raised Yeshua from the dead. C.F.D. Mole of Cambridge University has written, if the coming into existence of the Nazarenes rips a great hole in history, a hole the size and shape of the resurrection, what does the secular historian propose to stop it up with? The birth and rapid rise of the Jesus movement, says Mole, remain an unsolved enigma for any historian who refuses to take seriously the only explanation offered by the disciples themselves. Indeed, one of the world's leading Jewish theologians, the late Pincus Lapid, who taught at Hebrew University in Israel, declared himself convinced on the basis of the evidence that the God of Israel raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Here then is the basis for the hope that inspired Flynn. For someone has returned from the other side of death, from the far country, to tell us what lies beyond. And it is none other than the good shepherd, Yeshua, who gave his life for the sheep. He holds the key that unlocks the door to eternal life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. 
All who put their trust in him are members of his flock and will live in his house forever. Amen. Thank you.